Hi Melos, welcome back. Today I'm going to do my June books video. I am really excited, lots of good books to share with you this month. If you didn't watch my vlog though, the She's on a Deadline vlog, I recommend you go do that because yeah, I take you through the reading of a few of these and I had a lot of fun making that vlog and I'm really glad lots of you enjoyed it as well. But let's get into this month's wrap up roundup. Starting with our book club pick was James Baldwin's Giovanni's Room. This month's book club pick, by the way, is Beloved by Toni Morrison. I cannot wait to reread and discuss this one. I'm gonna start it tomorrow, I think. Giovanni's Room. This is my second Baldwin. I read Go Tell It on the Mountain a couple years ago now and really loved it. It had a really strong emotional effect on me, I remember. And this one was no different, to be honest. I mean, go to Baldwin if you want a gut punch of a novel. So he's just one of those authors I think you have to read in life. He was extraordinarily gifted, um, just an incredible prose stylist, really, really beautifully written books. He's not just a writer of beautiful sentences. His characters are really well fleshed out, they feel true to life, his dialogue is snappy and engaging to read, plotting is done carefully, you know, everything is done carefully in the books. It's not just beautiful sentence to sentence. It's kind of like an iconic gay novel, it's considered. It explores queerness in the context of the 1950s, specifically Paris in the 1950s, because that is where our narrator is. So we follow David, an American in Paris. He's left America because he's afraid of himself, essentially. He's running from himself, but of course, all he does in Paris is find himself. He's running from his um, fear of his attraction to other men uh, and what this says about him, what this will do to his relationship with his family, with his father. But of course, in Paris, he meets Giovanni and strikes up an affair with Giovanni, who is an Italian barman working at a gay bar. And then when David's fiance Hella returns from a trip in Spain, events begin to unravel, spin out of control and lead to tragedy. So David is deeply unlikable. He is the cause of much of the pain in this novel. He has a lot of internalised homophobia. He experiences a lot of shame, a lot of self-hatred and obviously directs that hatred outward as well. So it is a difficult read from that perspective. And I wasn't expecting the novel to be written from the point of view of the antagonist, essentially. So yeah, this is a heart-wrenching read. Please be warned. It definitely, I found it like emotionally difficult to read at times, but Baldwin is a master and he really deftly and masterfully explores what it meant to be gay, what it meant to be queer or bisexual at the time um, of writing. and he's just an incredible writer and you should read him. I also read the second novel in the Farseer trilogy, Robin Hobb's Farseer trilogy, in the month of June. This is Royal Assassin. It's a lot chunkier than the first instalment so it did take me a little while to get through but I really really enjoyed savouring it. Um, Robin Hobb just makes me feel like a giddy little child again. I love her books, I love her writing, it feels so comforting to me, but also, you know, interesting and dark and complex at the same time. There's some excellent character work in here. There are characters you are definitely going to fall in love with without falling into overdone tropes and types. Uh, there's a strong sense of psychological realism in Hobbes' work, which I really appreciate. You know, the characters feel real, they feel human. This feels like a human world with an added fantasy element which cannot be said of all of these fantasy authors. The writing can really be quite beautiful, quite poignant and moving um, in a sort of, they're not totally similar, her and Le Guin, but in a Le Guin-esque way. And yeah, I just feel like Hobb knows what she's doing. I've really noticed that a lot. I've been sort of sorting authors into knows exactly what they're doing and those authors that feel a little bit more unsure in their plotting, in their pacing, in, in their writing style, um, and I definitely prefer the former. I do think people get on with the work of the latter too, maybe more than I do, but I prefer an author who feels sure in what they're doing. Um, I feel like Hobb has that element to her writing. And yeah, alongside just being straight up enjoyable fantasy, um, you know, with the good characters, the good plot line, the great world building, um, there's some really good ideas in here too, some really interesting ideas, namely kind of coming from the magic systems. So 
Fix, the protagonist of this Farsia trilogy, he has the wit, which means he can sort of commune with and connect with animals. This is much maligned in society, you know, people think that if you employ the wit too much, then you might turn into a beast yourself. And this sort of breaking down of the boundaries between the human and the natural world and the animal world is something I follow a lot in my books. It's something I wrote about in my dis master's dissertation. I just love it. It appeals to me. That makes Hobbes' work feel very kind of vibrant and alive to today, even though this was written, you know, in the 90s now. So almost 30 years ago now. I would really recommend starting with the Farsia trilogy. So The Realm of the Elderlings is this like huge collection of books um, and they're usually broken down into trilogies so there's a few trilogies within this big series and this is the first one she wrote and published but you can enter at slightly different points but I'm glad I went with this one I've heard that the next trilogy the live ship traders is really really good people tend to prefer it even to this trilogy so I actually think starting with this one's better because then maybe you if you like this one you have something even better to go to. And yeah, I think it's a good introduction. I've been enjoying it because I've had that question a few times, like, where should I start? I think, I mean, I've only read two of the books, but I think where I've started is a solid place to start. Um, and finally, for this particular book, obviously I can't talk too much about what's in each book because you need to read the whole series really. But um, the ending of this book is incredible. I will not stop thinking about it. I haven't stopped thinking about it. It's probably one of my favorite endings to a book that I've read in a while. It just like struck me. <laughs> it's so, so good. Highly recommend these. Please read them. Okay, next is a book I don't have. I read it on my Kindle. It's called The Strange by Nathan Ballingrove. I've been talking about it a lot. I talked about it a lot in that blog that I mentioned and um, I talked about it a fair bit on the Discord as well because I really, really enjoyed it. I think partially it was a surprise element. So. Hearing me talk about it, you're not going to have that same surprise element going into it. But yeah, it just really appealed to me. I feel like it's one of those books that felt like a, like a home book, if you know what I mean. There's those books which are really, really good and impressive and incredible and maybe emotionally affect you. Like, for example, Giovanni's Room is just a stellar book. But then there's books that feel more kind of homely to you, like where you might reside mentally. Um, and I feel like Hobbes' work fits the bill there, and then for me, The Strange fits the bill. It just, it combines so many things that I really love in the books that I most sort of straight up enjoy. Um, and it just, yeah, surprised me. I wasn't, I, I was expecting something quite similar to The Martian by Andy Weir because the front cover of the UK, I think it's the UK edition, has this astronaut in it and the font I really really hate on the title as well but um, yeah and I liked The Martian but I wasn't like really enamoured with it but I found this really really delightful. It follows Annabelle Crisp. She's a 14 year old girl. She's living on Mars with her family um, and it's 1931 so Mars was first landed on in 1864 and it was colonised obviously by the time we start the book. And on Mars they mine this mysterious mineral called the Strange which gives their machines the illusion of intelligence and of personality which is like interesting to begin with. Just before the events of the novel Earth has gone silent. It's called The Silence and so there are no more supplies coming from Earth, people can't get in contact with their loved ones, they can't leave Mars. So these colonists are now Martians for good, basically. And the catalyst to the action is that Annabelle's family's diner is raided by some members of a nearby desert cult. And she is appalled by the lack of action by the local authorities. So she sets out to take revenge herself with her kitchen engine, as he's called, which is like a humanoid dishwashing machine that works in the diner with them. Um, and they set off to take revenge. So at its heart, this is like an adventure story, you know, and even the name Annabelle Crisp is beginning to give, I feel, a sense of this book. This book has been widely marketed as Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles meets Charles Portis's True Grit. I have read True Grit, but I haven't read The Martian Chronicles. I can really see the kind of influence or the comparison to True Grit because Annabelle shares a lot with Matty. If you were annoyed by Matty in True Grit, you're going to be annoyed by Annabelle as well. These are kind of hard talking, forthright 
young women from a particular era, you know. As I say, I haven't read the Martian Chronicles, but I can certainly see the influences of the 50s, 60s, 70s sci-fi. Um, it's got that really nostalgic feel. As I say, you may not connect too much to Annabelle. Um, she is a sort of type, um, as are her castmates, her fellow characters, but I think it adds by including that kind of style, and the style is there in the prose as well, a slightly old-fashioned style, it really adds something to the setting, it completes the setting, because otherwise setting it in 1931, I don't think you would have felt it so much if you didn't feel it in the actual style of the characters and the writing itself. So I think it really rounds out the book in that respect and gives it more of that nostalgic um, feel. So yes, it's already combining science fiction and the Western, which are two of my favourite genres. And he does mention a few other authors of both of those genres in his acknowledgements. But there's also an element of the weird and kind of horror element to this as well. And just a touch of Vandermeer in there, which I think just completes it for me. Those three genres sitting together in one book, I think was just perfection for me. His prose is lovely, um, but it's particularly his imagery that works so, so well in this book. You know, he uses the russety red colours of Mars in contrast with the green glow of this strange and really illuminates the scenes with these two contrasting elements in such a beautiful way, so much so that you really see it before your eyes and I won't forget some of these scenes based on just the way he uses light in the writing. And yeah, it's got the ideas, the plot progresses and what you find out about Mars and about the strange is interesting and kind of gripped me conceptually as well. Overall, I just found it a real joy to read. It just brings all these influences together in a really effortless, clever way. As I say, I just really enjoyed it. I found it engaging. I found it fun to read. And of course, it brought together so many of my favourite things. So I am actually not going to talk about this book, but I'm just going to show it to you. This is In Ascension by Martin McGuinness. Um, I read this in June, but I am going to reread it for August for book club. So I'm going to tell you about it then. Um, if you're wondering how I've got a paperback, I honestly have no idea <laughs> because the it's a trade paperback. I think it might only be available in the US. This has been a big thing on Discord and I've been talking to the publisher. Anyway, I ordered it somehow, this trade paperback, so I am in luck. Suffice it to say, I would recommend this book. It's a fantastic literary sci-fi for those of you who are looking for something that spans the two genres and I really look forward to discussing it and I will tell you more about it in August. Okay, next, Remains of the Day by Kazuo Ishiguro. This was a reread for me, but I last read it about 10 years ago, but I did remember like the overall kind of plot arc, um, but there were things I had forgotten as well. Yeah, I was very excited to return to it because I really liked it the first time I read it. It's about Stevens, he's head butler at Darlington Hall, which is a great English house. Um, and post World War II, these houses were in decline, you know, people were not living like they used to, the staff is much smaller, and people aren't having these balls and dinners and events like they used to. So Stevens has kind of dedicated his whole life to this job, to this service, and he's now seeing it in decline. Now, I'm not going to tell you any more about the plot of this book. If you have, if you manage to never come across this book or what it's about or the film, I will not spoil it for you, but it's really, really worth a read. It's a, it's a great example of the kind of thing Ishiguro loves to do in his novels. If you know a little bit, a little bit about Ishiguro, you might see what I'm getting at there. will probably break your heart right at the end there. Um, it's written in this really kind of pared back prose, which I do think some people kind of struggle to connect with Stevens, but I think Ishiguro is really inhabiting that butler voice, and I think it works really well for me. Um, I did find it less subtle than I did the first time round. The first time round I was really surprised by this book. Um, of course I've read it before, but I do think it was some, it was partially a little bit more maturity as a reader on my part, because I'm really kind of seeing all the, all the things hinted at throughout. But um, it was still very enjoyable, I really liked it, and it's a great read. 
I think a lot of people will enjoy this one. Next, we have Translation State by Anne Leckie. She has written a very famous and popular series of novels called the Imperial Ratch Trilogy, starting with Ancillary Justice. And this book is a standalone, but it's part of that universe. I read it for my Sunday Times review, but if I were you and this review convinces you to read some Anne Leckie, I recommend you go back and start at the beginning because I think there's probably some reference in, references in here that I missed out on and yeah I just think it would be better to read them in the correct order. So yeah this was my first foray into Leckie's work and obviously she's a much loved science fiction author um, and I was impressed by it, I really liked it, there was lots to like in here. It's narrated from the point of view of three characters, we have N.A who is this middle-aged woman, her grandmother has just died and she finds herself sort of at a loss. Someone has come in and swept up her grandmother's estate, essentially given her a job as well to occupy her, to get her out of the house. She's not really expected to do this, but the job is to find a missing person. She decides to take it seriously and actually look for this missing person. Then we also have Reet, who is a kind of alienated figure in society. He doesn't know much about his biological family, but he does have an adoptive family that really loves him. There's some interesting bits about adoption in here. And he's approached by a group of people who think he is from this particular place. And obviously he is very interested in this and in them. And then finally we have Kven, who is a Prescott translator, which is some sort of alien human hybrid um, that has been created to fill the gap between the terrifying Prescas and humans. So he's a translator, essentially. There's actually some quite complex gender dynamics going on here, which I don't exactly remember the ins and outs of, so forgive me if I'm misgendering the characters. Kven's perspective was probably my favourite, just completely bonkers. And that's partly because they want to dissect the humans, the bodies around them. <laughs> there's quite some, there's some gruesome scenes in here and a little bit of kind of body horror style stuff, um, which was interesting. Despite this, this novel is surprisingly sweet. I actually think perhaps a little too sentimental, but I'm willing to forgive it. I'd rather a novel be a little bit too sentimental than have no points of warmth and hum humanity in it at all. I would say the first half of it was stronger stronger when we were being introduced to these characters, introduced to the plot line. Um, I think it kind of devolves a little, a little bit towards the end. It gets kind of strangely bureaucratic and then there's one scene which is a tiny bit repetitive towards the end, but there were so many interesting ideas in here. It reads so weird, <laughs> like it reads very alien at times. Um, which I appreciated. It, you know, felt unique, it felt different to a lot of the other space opera stuff that I've read. And there, yeah, like I say, there were some great, great ideas in here. Um, it kind of generally explores what it means to be a human sort of by the end, but I actually think that's probably one of the less interesting themes in this book. I don't think she's exploring it in, you know, a particularly exciting way. I've seen it done slightly better in other books, but um, as I say, the gender dynamics are really interesting here and just some of the imaginative ways she uses kind of the concept of alien um, throughout, I, I really appreciate it. So yeah, I think it's well worth a read, but as I say, start from the top, I reckon, um, and I would like to read the original trilogy myself at some point soon. But I think this one will appeal to existing fans as well if you are an existing fan of Lecky. I'm sure this will appeal to you too. Okay, Wild Swans, what an epic journey this book is and an epic feat as well. I mean, Chang brings together an incredible amount of threads of storyline here to create a whole um, and that is impressive in and of itself. She follows three women, uh, her grandmother, her mother and herself across about 60 years. I'm, I was surprised it was only 60 years of Chinese history when I came to write my review for this um, because it feels like a lot because a lot happened in China during those 60 years. So um, she's obviously exploring their personal story but at the same time she is telling the story of China through their eyes. Um, the rise of Mao and the People's Republic of China and you know the Cultural Revolution, the effects of the Cultural Revolution. She covers all of that in here. Yeah, I thought this was a really great accessible way to learn a little bit more about this period through the eyes of one particular family. It's an incredible amount of history, so to do it in a slightly focused way through 
through a particular selection of people is, is I think a good way to learn about it. It is pretty, does get pretty dark pretty often. I mean, it's relentless. But yeah, I learned a lot from this book about um, this time and place in history. Can I speak to the, you know, complete accuracy of everything Chang writes? No, I mean, it is a memoir. I allow her some license to kind of make things a good story, readable, etc. But I have no doubt that kind of the force of the narrative has the ring of truth, you know? And, you know, she's describing her experience as well. However, you know me, and the literary style of something is so important to me as a reader. It's something I read for, and it's why I don't read a lot of non-fiction, because a lot of non-fiction writers are not paying that much attention, at least to the extent that fiction writers do, to the style of what they're writing and in that respect I wasn't really really engaged with this. I either sort of wanted it to be more story-like and more fictionalized or even more historical at times. It was kind of the way it was towing the line wasn't quite working for me so what I have been doing recently to counterbalance this trait in myself is to listen to it instead because I'm much less focused on style, much more focused on the content of what I'm listening to and that helped a lot. Um, I mean, I would recommend listening to it as well because it's a first-hand account, but it's chunky, okay? So it's a lot of hours. I, I did enjoy listening to it. I'm glad I read it. It's also kind of culturally iconic in its own way. My mum has a copy on her shelves. I feel like I've seen it in so many houses that I've been to in, in life. Um, you know, it was a big hit when it came out. You know, I'm glad I went with it and continued with it and I feel like I learned a lot about the cultural revolution which I feel like will stand me in good stead when I come and read another Chinese writer's work particularly thinking of like Cixin Liu's work because I know that he drew on the history of the cultural revolution for the in the remembrance of the earth's past trilogy um so yes but anyway that was wild swans and now I actually own this book but I ran up and down the stairs collecting books so many times that I was like I'm not getting this one, but I read, actually I listened to The Stranger Times by C.K. McDonnell. Um, this was just a little bit of fun. It's kind of silly, but enjoyable and funny. Um, I don't often read funny books. Um, so yeah, it's about, it's set in Manchester uh, and it's about a newspaper uh, which reports on the weird and wonderful around the world. But something weird, but not wonderful, is happening in Manchester on their very doorstep. So it has this, as I say, it has this kind of humorous style. I think C.K. McDonald has actually been a stand-up comedian um, or is a stand-up comedian. So yeah, it has a funny style. It would probably bear comparison to the likes of Terry Pratchett, even though I actually haven't read any um, sold Terry Pratchett. I've read Good Omens, um, which I had kind of mixed feelings about. Um, I think I was expecting maybe more of it than it was giving. But <laughs> yeah, I, d I don't know. Terry Pratchett fans, I'm sure, will say that C.K. McDonald is not as good, which... I'm willing to believe, um, but there's something to that comparison, I reckon. There are some good jokes here, uh, which I feel like is hard to do in the novel format. I tell you what, though, the the narrator on this, like the audio narrator, was so good. He did such a good job, which I think really enhanced my enjoyment of this book. I don't know whether I would have enjoyed it as much if I had actually just straight up read it. Um, he did a really, really good job. Of course, you can't expect every joke to land. But luckily, like not every, you know, when you read, sometimes you read a funny book and like literally every sentence is trying to be a joke. And it's like, give it a rest. <laughs> this one, it doesn't have that. Like there's jokes, but there are also more serious moments, which I appreciate it. The characters are all your kind of typical types. There's no surprises here. There's not really any surprises in the plot either. But I still felt drawn to the characters. You know, I was following along. I was enjoying it. Maybe again, it was the audio narrator. I don't know. I had fun listening to it. If it sounds like something you might enjoy then I would try it but I wouldn't say you must go out and read this one. Okay finally we have Lavinia. I know she's at the end of the video, my sweet Le Guin. Um, this was her last book I think. This novel will certainly appeal to many readers okay it's just I'm not one of them and I'll tell you why. I have some sort of complex. I don't know what it is I pride myself on being interested in basically anything. I think everything can be interesting, but I am not interested <laughs> in the classics. I'm not interested really in Greco-Roman mythology. I don't know why. I just can't connect with it. 
I don't really like it. It alienates me somehow. I'm sure it's a complex I've got, but yeah, I just, whenever it's included in literature, I just can't bring myself to care. Um, so you all know I'm trying to read, I don't know if I'm going to make it guys, but I'm trying to read uh, the rest of Le Guin's work this year. But as I say, I haven't read enough of it. So we'll see about that. Um, so that's why I did read this, because you might be saying, why on earth would you read Lavinia? But that is why. Yeah, it just, we didn't get on really. We didn't get on, but there were things to like. But before I get into the rest of it, again, I listened to this. You'll notice I'm listening to a lot of books recently because I haven't had a lot of actual reading time. So I do all my reading, well, not all my reading, but lots of my reading through audio these days. But the narrator did the most heavy handed, overwrought delivery of Le Guin's beautiful prose. It drove me nuts. Okay, it was so annoying, so that definitely didn't help. Um, so obviously this novel follows the Lavinia of the Aeneid. Um, she was barely more than a bit part in Virgil's epic poem, but Le Guin is obviously fleshing out her story here. Um, and interestingly she has this kind of metafictional technique whereby Lavinia interacts with the dying shade of Virgil himself, and Virgil tells her stuff about what will happen in her life and in turn she sort of recognises her own fictitiousness, the fact that she is a fictional character. It's just classic Le Guin, she had to squeeze a little something interesting in there and I appreciated it, had nothing, no problems with that, um, apart from the fact that I'm not interested in Virgil's poem to begin with. Unfortunately for me this novel I think covers too much of what actually happens in the poem itself. I wished Le Guin had either focused on the before or the after or just the before and after I mean I would have preferred the before the most because then we would have had the least amount of poem inclusion um, rather than the after when we would have had to have had Aeneas I mean she never writes very big books and she always covers a lot of ground in these kind of slightly shorter books it's just her style it's her vibe she's she doesn't write these kind of long detailed worlds in the way that sort of Hobb does she's an ideas woman um, and I think it lets, for me at least, it lets her down here because we're just covering too much. I wish she had maybe, as I say, just even focused on Lavinia's kind of childhood up to the point where she meets Aeneas. I did enjoy parts of the first part of the book when she, Lavinia is describing her life in ancient Italy, kind of rural ancient Italy. It's the type of thing Le Guin writes beautifully. Um, just when Aeneas arrives, I was like, ugh. Yeah, it was a bit of a slog. This novel will be for many readers. People do like this book. If you are an existing fan of Le Guin and you also like mythic retellings, give it a go, for sure. It's definitely unlike Madeline Miller. I haven't read Madeline Miller's work, in case you can't tell for obvious reasons, <laughs> but um, I don't think it will be like, it's like a Le Guin, it's a real Le Guin take, this one. You might like her take if you like retellings. So yes, I'm gonna leave it there. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching today. I hope you enjoyed and I will see you again very soon. Bye.